This section of acute coronary syndromes will cover the treatment, and we are going to emphasize which drugs lower mortality, which is the most frequently asked question about the treatments for coronary syndromes. Management of acute ST segment elevation MIs, angioplasty is superior. Now, it's superior if you can get it. Superior means survival, mortality, less bleeding. You don't bleed into your brain as much with angioplasty as you do with thrombolytics. The complications. What complications? Ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation, thrombus, aneurysm, rupture, rupture, thrombus, aneurysm, V-fib, VTAC. Tamponade. All of these are less with angioplasty. Pop open that clot and you're going to feel much better. And you live much better. Ladies and gentlemen, the standard of care is to do that angioplasty or percutaneous coronary intervention within 90 minutes of arriving. But sometimes students get confused. They confuse the time from the onset of pain to the time from the onset of coming to the emergency room. When you order up a pizza, they don't agree to feed you within 30 minutes of becoming hungry. They agree to feed you within 30 minutes of you calling. So thrombolytics is within 30 minutes of coming to the emergency room but up to 12 hours after the onset of chest pain. Angioplasty is within 90 minutes of coming to the emergency room so that your door to balloon time is under 90 minutes. If you take 100 people who get their angioplasty at 70 minutes and you take another 100 people who get their angioplasty at 120 minutes, the people who have their angioplasty at 70 minutes simply live a lot longer and they live better. The complications of angioplasty or percutaneous coronary intervention is that since it can rupture the coronary artery, almost all places have cardiac surgery. However, what we've seen over time is, is that the ability to do primary angioplasty where you can just transfer someone for coronary surgery in the event that they do rupture is perfectly fine. It's perfectly fine. As a matter of fact, I'm in a hospital like that. We do primary angioplasty morning, noon, and night. We do it. You can get uh, coronary angioplasty. They are faster than you can get lunch. And uh, we haven't ruptured one, and we don't have on-site cardiac surgery. So when I'm in a place like this, the biggest problems are restenosis, And that's why you have to use a stent and you have to use a stent that's coated, and you have to use dual antiplatelet therapy. Now, the problem is that that's also why you get hematomas, because the heparin and the platelet drugs can make you have a hematoma at the site of entry into the artery. Uh, only 20% of hospitals can do primary angioplasty, and that is why um, you have to be able to say, well, if your angioplasty can be done in 90 minutes, like let's say they give you a question that says, there's a place to do angioplasty across the street that's easily available then the answer would be transfer. They will explicitly tell you whether or not the angioplasty could be done right away. And the on-site surgical backup does not have to be in the same building. It just has to be close. Which of these is the most important in decreasing the risk of restenosis after angioplasty? The answer is drug eluding stents. Paclitaxel, that's like chemotherapy. Wow. Sirolimus. Sirolimus or sirolimus is in a group of T cell inhibiting medications. Sirolimus, pimicrolimus, tacrolimus. And these are drugs that are used to prevent, believe it or not, organ transplant rejection too, aplastic anemia. They are immunosuppressives. Because it turns out that a large part of the reason you re stenose is the immune system gets upset with you and causes a proliferation of immune cells that clogs off the stent. Isn't that amazing? So this is actually rapamycin. That's the other name for this drug, T-cell inhibiting drug. Bone marrow transplants and organ transplant rejection. Doing one vessel at a time doesn't really change anything. You'd think it would, but it doesn't. It just doesn't. And as a matter of fact, you increase the risk of complications by going in multiple times and causing more hematomas. Heparin is short-term. There is no such thing as long-term heparin for a person who has angioplasty. Use it at the time of procedure, and that is it. Warfarin simply does not help with arteries. Warfarin is for wanes. 
Aspirin is for arteries, and warfarin is for veins. Deep vein is thrombosis, warfarin. Pulmonary embolus, warfarin. Arteries, cerebral artery, aspirin. Coronary artery, aspirin. Peripheral artery, aspirin. Carotid artery, aspirin. But not warfarin. Warfarin is for veins. Bare metal stents is exactly the opposite of drug eluding stents. And there's more restenosis. Warfarin is for DVT and PE, not for coronary arteries. And bare metal stents has a 30% restenosis rate. And that's why we should not be using them. Restenosis within six months after angioplasty, without any stent at all, you just balloon them, they'll restenose one third of the time. That is why stenting is the standard of care. Now, bare metal stents still are irritating, so they restenose more than a drug eluding stent, which simply inhibit the immune system. Because remember, restenosis is like irritation, it's inflammatory. Think of it like putting a little topical steroids on the inside of your coronary artery. Now, if you can't use thrombolytics and you have a person who's arrived at a hospital for which there is no angioplasty and you have a contraindication to thrombolytics, this is the person who has to be transferred to a facility that does angioplasty. Angioplasty is better. Okay, I'm at the four out of five hospitals that don't have angioplasty. All right, I want to use thrombolytics. Oh, no, I had a stroke six months ago. I can't use thrombolytics. Okay. You got to get transferred for angioplasty. Now, since we have to figure out who must be transferred for angioplasty if they have a contraindication of thrombolytics, we better be 100% sure we know them. Major bleeding is defined as bowel and brain, and not a little guaiac positive stool. We mean big blood, melanoma, black stool, red blood, red blood. Into the brain, any bleeding into the brain is certainly a contraindication. Surgery three months ago is not a contraindication of thrombolytics now, and it has to be big surgery within the last two weeks. I had my gallbladder taken out, something big. Severe hypertension, very precise diagnosis, 180 over 110, or your head will explode. And a non-hemorrhagic stroke in the last six months has a greater likelihood of being converted into blood if we do the thrombolytics now. Remember, this obsession with doing the rectal exam on little old ladies coming with heart disease, I've never understood this. Because even if it's guaiac positive brown stool, guaiac positive brown stool is not a contraindication to thrombolytics. It's not. Do the thrombolytics. You see how this question very specifically tells you. We're in a small rural hospital with no cath lab. It's not a guesswork. It's not subjective. You're being told. You got chest pain and ST elevation. What do you want to do? And the answer is thrombolytics now is better than angioplasty four hours from now or three hours from now. Mediocre food in 15 minutes is better than the world's greatest food tomorrow. Don't consult cardiology. I don't need cardiology to tell me to use thrombolytics. It's not the right answer because the whole point is even the phone call delays the administration of the medication. And that's why time is muscle. Delay equals death. Door to needle. Hi, I have chest pain. Thrombolytics have to be in you within 30 minutes. Now, if it's in 12 hours of the onset of chest pain, by the time they arrived in the emergency room, 30 minutes to having that thrombolytic in the vein. Let's recap our therapies and understand that everyone needs aspirin at first. It's the best initial therapy for everybody. Combining it with clopidogrel for all MIs, angioplasty and stenting, but it could be aspirin and clopidogrel or aspirin, prasigrel, clopidogrel or ticagrelor. Beta blockers in everybody, and we don't have to keep saying in the absence of a contraindication, because that's everything in the absence of contraindication. Just remember that beta blockers are not acutely life-saving. It doesn't matter whether you start them now or in 60 minutes or in an hour and a half, just as long as you get them sometime. 
and ACE and ARBs should be given to every acute MI, but the mortality benefit is greatest. We have the low ejection fraction. Statins also are given for all acute MIs, and the greatest mortality is clearly beneficial for those with an LDL above 100. Oxygen and nitrates have no clear mortality. There's one of those things we just give. Oxygen is particularly useless. And heparin will not reopen a blood vessel. Heparin is given after thrombolytics and angioplasty to keep it open briefly, briefly, for a day after to keep it open. But it is not going to reopen a blood vessel. Heparin is very useful for people who have non-ST segment elevation MIs or other acute coronary syndromes to prevent clots from forming. It will not break open a clot. And calcium channel blockers have not been shown to lower mortality in any form of acute coronary syndrome. We use them when you can't tolerate beta blockers, when you have cocaine-induced pain or Prinz metals. That's not the same thing as saying they actually lower mortality. This is simply when we use them. A man's in the emergency room for chest pain for the last hour. It's crushing in quality. It doesn't change with respiration or position. And he's got very clear ST segment depression. Depression. After aspirin, what will benefit this person the most? Pause and look the thing that will benefit this person the most is heparin because this is a person who's in the process of forming a clot in the coronary. When you're in the process of forming a clot, heparin prevents clots from forming. Heparin does not dissolve clots that have already formed. They prevent clots from forming. Thrombolytics dissolve clots, but thrombolytics simply don't lower mortality in ST depression. This is one of the most frequent mistakes that a student will make. Even if it's a real MI, it's not enough to have ST depression. Thrombolytics only are used. ST elevation within 12 hours of the onset of chest pain or a new left bundle branch block. ST elevation within 12 hours or a new left Bundle. That's the thrombolytic indications. That's the thrombolytics, ST elevation or new left bundle. Glycoprotein 2B3 inhibitors, abscisabab, tyrofiban, and aptifibatide. Abscisabab, tyrofiban, and aptifibatide. These are platelet inhibitors. The glycoprotein 2B3 inhibitor is, affects a receptor. That's a receptor on a platelet. And these are drugs that are given generally intravenously during stenting in a cath lab. And they help prevent restenosis. Nitroglycerin and morphine are drugs that basically, although they may be used, don't have a clear mortality benefit. And angioplasty is good. Angioplasty might be useful. It's just not first. It's not first. Beta blockers are not useful emergently. They do help at some point and should be given, but they're not as important as preventing a clot from forming. You've got to think of this like a pulmonary embolus, like throwing off an acute embolus into the lung. Get an anticoagulant to prevent it from growing. Eptifibotide, tyrofiben, and abscissimab, besides being unpronounceable names, they basically are used in acute coronary syndromes in conjunction with angioplasty and stenting. They help prevent restenosis. They will not help in ST elevation. They simply don't help in ST elevation. They stop platelet aggregation, but they're not to be used instead of aspirin or clopidogrel. They're additions specifically for people who are going to get stented. They do reduce mortality, and we use them in ST segment depression for those who have very high risk findings, such as troponins and CK elevation, and people who are going to get relatively urgent angioplasty. They are restenosis preventers in those getting angioplasty and stent. They are restenosis preventers acutely. There is no such thing as chronic 
glycoprotein 2b3 inhibitor use, they are never chronic drugs, ever. So at the end of the day, let's summarize the difference between these different disease manifestations of coronary disease. All versions of coronary disease should get an aspirin if you can tolerate it. All versions of coronary disease need a beta blocker. All versions of chest pain and coronary disease need nitrates. So what's the difference? Anticoagulation is the difference. Stable angina, there's no point in anticoagulating someone. They're not forming a clot now. Here it is. You ready? Bing! An acute clot that's forming. An acute clot that's forming. That's when you use the heparin to prevent the acute clot forming. Heparin will help prevent restenosis, but only after you popped it open with thrombolytics. Glycoprotein 2B3 inhibitors is never a chronic medication. It is exclusively unstable angina and preventing restenosis. These drugs will not open a clogged coronary artery. They're adjunctive at best. Now I'm looking at acute anticoagulation. There is no point in using thrombolytics with stable angina. And in ST elevation, we can use it, but it's not as good as angioplasty. It's simply not as good. Remember, the most common wrong answer on thrombolytics is wanting to use it in unstable angina or non-ST segment elevation MIs. That's the most common wrong answer. Calcium channel blockers should not be used routinely in any of them, and warfarin is not used routinely in any of them. Bottom line, you notice we give it at the bottom here, right? Thrombolytics, ST elevation. Heparin, non-ST elevation. And GP2B3 emitters after stenting in non-ST elevation. And calcium channel blockers and warfarin have no mortality benefit. The final thing is that low molecular weight heparin is the standard of care for almost everything. In fact, the only time we even use unfractionated heparin anymore is when we want a short half-life and we want it to go away quickly. Other than that, low molecular weight heparin is clearly superior for acute coronary syndromes, and we use it in pulmonary emboli, DVT, acute coronary syndromes, virtually everywhere, as long as we don't need to have it reversed right away. Because IV unfractionated heparin simply lasts a shorter period of time. One of the major differences between the very high functioning student on step two and the person who's just passing is that the high functioning person knows what to do when it says the initial therapies have been given but the patient is not better or there's a complication. In non-ST segment elevation ACS and all the meds have been given and the patient's not better, everyone has to undergo angioplasty and perhaps intervention. So let's be clear on what we mean by not better. It means you did everything and the pain didn't go away. Or the heart is outright failing. It's dying in front of you. How do I know that? Because they're developing Rawls and S3 and shortness of breath. Or you come in with ST segment depression. Now you have ST elevation. Or you did angioplasty and you did some other intervention, but the troponins are rising. Get back in there. See what's going on in the coronaries directly. If someone's not better. But be precise on what we mean by not better. Let's summarize our management of all acute coronary syndromes between ST elevation and non-ST segment elevation. And remember, you can't tell whether it's non-ST elevation MI and unstable angina until after you have troponins or CKMBs. Both of them get the same basic medical therapy, aspirin and clopidogrel, beta blockers, statins, ACE, morphine, nitrates. That's all of them. The difference is that non-ST elevation, non-ST elevation gets heparin and early or fairly quick angioplasty and angiography. And ST elevations definitely should go immediately to angioplasty within 90 minutes after arriving. Thrombolytics are only if angioplasty is not available 
and that's 12 hours after the onset of pain. Now, here's one new thing. This is not done too much, but the ultimate, ultimate, ultimate is I did thrombolytics, I did angioplasty, and I still have pain. What can I do? Now, this is very rare, but it's still the answer. This is how you get the 305 on step two, which is you do emergency bypass. That's the only thing you could do. What if the person's pain ultimately didn't go away? You'd have to get in there and bypass it. If you can't use thrombolytics because of major bowel and brain and bowel and brain, recent surgery or hypertension or non-hemorrhagic stroke recently, this person must be transferred for angioplasty. Our next section is the complications of myocardial infarctions. All complications of myocardial infarctions have hypotension. But what's different is that they have different murmurs and heart rates. It is an excellent source of what's the most likely diagnosis questions, which is, by the way, the most common question on step two. They all cause low blood pressure. All low blood pressure can cause confusion and disorientation. So that's not going to help you. In terms of answering the question, what is the most likely diagnosis? Look first to the heart rate to answer that question. Hypotension will not allow you to answer the question since all the complications of myocardial infarction can give you hypotension. Consequently, all of them can give you lightheadedness and confusion. The heart rate is a key to establishing a diagnosis because sinus bradycardia is so common in myocardial infarction because it's from ischemia of the sinoatrial node. Third degree of you block is bradycardia, hypotension, Canon A waves. You distinguish it from sinus bradycardia from these Canon A waves. The Canon A wave is because to 19th century men, the neck vein looked like a cannon shot was going through it. Boom, boom, boom. Against a closed tricuspid valve from AV dissociation. And that's how you distinguish it from sinus bradycardia. Because this is something that you can have a low heart rate in both of them, hypotension in both of them, but only third degree AV block has the cannon A wave. That's the only thing you can use to tell before you get the EKG because there's atrial systole and the tricuspid valve is closed because the ventricle and atrium are out of coordination with each other. So this cannon A wave bouncing up into the neck is also associated with right ventricular infarction because the right coronary artery supplies the right ventricle, the inferior wall, and the AV node. So you have the same arterial supply supplying all of them, the right ventricle, the inferior wall, the AV node. So that's why you get a lot of AV block with inferior wall MIs. Now, the things that we're doing now, this is where we're going to nudge up, nudge up, and you're going to find no surprises for yourself on test day, trust me. What you're going to do is you're going to look for a person who's got an inferior wall infarction because 40% of inferior walls have either right ventricular infarction or AV block. But AV block by itself is not such a big deal. Third degree AV block is a big deal. Atropine and pacemaker. All symptomatic bradycardias get atropine first. All of them. Symptomatic means lightheaded, confused, and hypotensive, and give me some atropine. Speed me up. And you should do that first because, you know what, I would personally find it much more comfortable to get a little squirt of atropine than a transcutaneous or transvenous pacemaker. And if it's a third degree AV block, then you put the pacemaker, but atropine first. Now, all permanent third-degree AV blocks are going to need a pacemaker. But if they're symptomatic, atropine is the best initial therapy. The right ventricular infarction is not going to leap off the page and shout. It's associated with the inferior wall infarction, clear lungs, and often tachycardia. You can't get blood into the lungs if it can't get into the heart. The first thing you must do is take the EKG leads off 
the left side of the chest and flip them over to the right side. Just the, take them, put them on the other direction. That's called right ventricular leads. And the most specific finding is simply finding ST segment elevation in the fourth right ventricular lead. In other words, the same way an anterior wall infarction, you'd see ST elevation in V2 to V4. It's the same thing, just on the other side of the chest. Right ventricular infarction is a small knowledge base. Embrace it. Don't avoid it. Inferior wall infarction, clear lungs, right ventricle leads, give fluids. That's it. Now, this is also because the right coronary supplies that right ventricle, the AV node. That's why you get so many heart blocks and the inferior wall. And that's why so many of them are associated with right ventricular infarctions. It's coming off the same arterial trunk. And there's no specific therapy. You can't, you don't go in and do new angioplasty. You don't specifically pace the right ventricle because the right ventricle is largely a passive conduit. You only have a pressure of 25 systolic, 25 systolic, 15 diastolic. Just don't give things like nitroglycerin, which will vasodilate the person and the person's blood pressure will bottom out. Avoid vasodilators and fill the tank and you'll be fine. The number one question for you is to simply recognize what is the most likely diagnosis. Tamponade is an unusual complication, fortunately. All complications of MI, such as tamponade, which is from a free wall rupture, have become far less common because of angioplasty and thrombolytics. When we have an untreated infarction, the muscle dies, it weakens, it ruptures, you die. But if you get in there and revascularize, you're essentially preventing death of the muscle so it doesn't rupture. Now, when it does rupture, you're going to look for a chief complaint of, hey, doc, I woke up dead. Pulseless electrical activity, sudden loss of pulse. The lungs are clear. Pulseless electrical activity, which means you can't diagnose it so you get an EKG. You're dead with an EKG that might look normal. The most accurate test is echocardiography, and you do a pericardiocentesis on your way into the operating room for repair if you manage to survive. Interior wall infarction, sudden loss of pulse, electrical alternance sometimes, big complex, little complex, big complex, little complex on that EKG, pulseless electrical activity. The most common cause of death with acute myocardial infarction is ventricular arrhythmia. If a person loses a pulse from ventricular tachycardia, there is no way to distinguish ventricular tachycardia from ventricular fibrillation. Both can cause sudden death. Both cause a loss of pulse. And you can't tell them apart until EKG. If they lose pulse, they're both managed the same way. Acute electrical cardioversion or defibrillation. Now the word defibrillation means electrical cardioversion is applied to ventricular fibrillation. And so people can get very, very confused about, well, cardiovert, defibrillate, what's the difference? Well, they're both an electrical paddle on your chest. Cardioversion means electricity converting you into normal sinus rhythm and defibrillation is just a term applied to converting ventricular fibrillation. But pulseless ventricular tachycardia, ventricular tachycardia that's so bad that there's no pulse, is managed exactly the same way as ventricular fibrillation. And these complications, this is the reason that patients go to the ICU. This is the reason why you can't manage acute MIs on a regular hospital floor and why not at home. Because if they develop VTAC and VFib, you have literally minutes to get them fixed. Minutes, three minutes, five minutes, seven minutes, even with CPR, 10% per minute become all the way dead. So you've got to get them shocked right away. Valve and septal rupture occur when the myocardial infarction kills off the papillary muscle. You recognize it because there's a new onset of a murmur and often congestion failure pulmonary congestion, Rawls, tachycardia. Mitral regurgitation 
is heard at the apex and radiates the axilla. Ventricular septal rupture is heard at the lower left sternal border, rather where the tricuspid area is, the lower left sternal border. You cannot distinguish them too easily from physical findings because mm, axilla, lower left sternal border is close. That's why in the emergency room or in an intensive care unit, if you have a catheterization in someone, and you have a catheter in the right side of the heart. And you say, what's my saturation in the right atrium? You say, oh, my right atrial saturation is 60 or 50. What's my right ventricular saturation? 75 and 80. Well, how did that saturation go up going across the tricuspid valve? How did the saturation go up going across the tricuspid valve? Why is there a step up in saturation? Because I got a hole in my heart. Valve rupture does not do this. Septal rupture causes step up in saturation. And you might say, well, why not do an echocardiogram? Well, echocardiogram is good. You got an echocardiographer in your hospital 24 hours a day, seven days a week that reads echoes instantly within the hour? Maybe you do. Not everybody does. Maybe you do. Even if you do, he's not there all the time. You are there with a catheter. Step up in saturation. Besides that, it's simply the question. Valve rupture and septal rupture are complications of myocardial infarction, developing most commonly from acute anterior wall infarctions. Most often they take two to seven days to develop post-MI as the papillary muscle necrosis. If there are patients who had a delay to angioplasty or thrombolytics, this results in greater myocardial necrosis, resulting in a greater likelihood of valve and septal rupture. You look for the sudden onset of a new murmur, Mitral regurge at the axilla, ventricular septal at the lower left sternal border. Echo is the most accurate test. And although echocardiogram may be the most accurate test, you can't depend on buzzwords necessarily like step up. They may just give you the numbers and say, hey, saturation is one thing in the atrium and another thing in the ventricle. Now, the reason why this is important is because, number one, you have to get a balloon pump in people before they die. And they get that balloon pump before they go to the operating room. Because a balloon pump is used not too often, but it contracts and relaxes and contracts and relaxes in timing with the cardiac cycle. It's enough to keep you alive while waiting to get you into the operating room. It basically is like putting an extra ventricle in your heart. To give you an extra push, it goes into the artery. It goes just outside the aortic valve. And as the blood is ejected, it goes And then like a relay race, it inflates and helps push the blood forward. It augments your left ventricle and helps give a push forward to the blood. But it's never permanent. You cannot walk around with this thing. It's a bridge to surgery over a few hours or a day at most for acute valve or septal rupture, balloon, pump, temporary, keep you alive. For acute valve or septal rupture, balloon pump, temporarily keeps you alive. So as we said, the main way you tell if there's a second infarction is that you'll look for a new bump up in CKMBs. But what will tell you to go chasing it? Number one thing, you had an infarction, you're fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. And then, ay, 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 I'm not so fine. Ay, 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 you got I can't breathe. I got pain, I got pain. Now you get a bump up in CKMBs. Now you get the sudden onset of pulmonary edema. Now you need a new EKG to be able to tell us it's time to get back in there. You can retreat someone with thrombolytics two days later. Did you know that? You can retreat them with angioplasty. Hey, maybe you got angioplasty and you re -stenosed. How do you know you re -stenosed? Because I got new pain. How do you know you re -stenosed? I got new pain. You continue all the same drugs and get back in there and pop them open again. Thrombolytic them again. CKMBs bump up. Repeat the EKG and get back in and open them up. Mural, like a piece of artwork put on a wall. It's called a mural. Well, we have a new piece of artwork for the interior wall of your heart called a thrombus. The aneurysms, well, we don't do anything about them. If you kill off part of your heart, it weakens, it can bulge out. 
but we can't actually do anything about it until it ruptures. Can't resect them prophylactically. If a thrombus forms within the aneurysm, we treat it like any other thrombus, like a pulmonary embolus or deep venous thrombosis. Heparin followed by warfarin. That's it. Let's summarize our most likely diagnosis questions for the complications of MI so we make 100% sure we get all the questions right. When is the answer third degree AV block? Bradycardia, hypotension, can in A waves. Sinus bradycardia can look exactly the same way, except no cannon A waves. Same treatment acutely, atropine. Same treatment, atropine pacemaker, but no cannon A waves. Now, tamponade and wall rupture, you'll look for the sudden loss of pulse. And the right ventricular infarction is the history of the inferior wall infarction, clear lungs, and hypotension. Treat them with fluids and do a right ventricular lead EKG. Acute valve rupture has a new murmur, rolls, and congestion. The septal rupture has the same thing, except there's a step up in saturation as you enter the right ventricle. But the most accurate test is an echocardiogram, and ventricular fibrillation is, gee, doc, I woke up feeling dead today. But I can't tell for sure until I have an EKG, and then shock me. In preparation for discharge from the hospital, what are we going to do about the detection of persistent ischemia? Well, we need to know before somebody leaves whether they need to be catheterized or need to be bypassed. Do they need revascularization or just medications? Well, first of all, do a stress test prior to discharge if they've had a myocardial infarction. The next thing is the stress test determines if angiography is needed because if that stress test is normal, you don't need the angiogram. If the stress test is abnormal, you do need the angiogram because only angiography determines the need for revascularization. Only the angiography can determine the need for either angioplasty or bypass surgery. Everyone should go home on aspirin, clopidogrel, aspirin, clopidogrel, metoprolol, statins, aspirin, clopidogrel, metoprolol, and statin, and an ACE inhibitor. And it's best for anterior wall infarctions. Everybody, this is the standard of care for acute myocardial infarctions. Post-management, go home. And dipertamol has one indication. It's used for strokes, but not in the heart. Dipertamol is not a heart drug. It's not, just not strong enough. We used to use it for other things, but like peripheral arterial disease, again, not strong enough. It's a stroke drug. That's it, dipertamol. Clopidogrel is used in everybody who has an MI, clopidogrel, prasugrel, ticagrelor, in all MIs, if you're intolerant of aspirin or post-stenting. If you have cough from ACE inhibitors, ARBs, and you could construct a question for ticlopidine, mostly if they said adverse effects, neutropenia TTP, Cyclopidine, neutropenia, TTP. But what if they told you, hey, there was a person who was intolerant of aspirin and clopidogrel? You could find a rare place for it. Now, antiarrhythmic medications was controversial for a long time. The reasoning went like this. Everyone who has an MI, the most common cause of death is arrhythmia. So don't wait for the arrhythmia. Give them prophylactic antiarrhythmic. It is 100% wrong but the major issue is, don't be fooled when they talk about, hey, this person has five PVCs a minute, 100 PVCs an hour, doesn't make any difference. Also, if somebody has persistent PVCs, you should be just simply giving beta blockers. These antiarrhythmic medications are generally always wrong outside of an acute ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation. But then again, it would not be prophylactic, would it? So prophylactic, preventing the arrhythmias, is always wrong, no matter how many times they say, lots of PVCs. The subject of sexual activity post-MI has changed in the last year or two. If you see sources that say it's okay to have sex right away, that's because that was the standard of care for a long time. The clearest question 
is not to use nitrates with Viagra or Sildenafil or Vardenafil because it causes profound hypotension. You will be asked and you will get it right. Now, erectile dysfunction is not most common from beta blockers. And besides, you need those beta blockers. So it's better to be alive with a little bit of penile hypotension than to be dead with the erection. So keep the beta blocker on. And remember, the most common cause of erectile dysfunction post myocardial infarction is anxiety. But the most common medication that causes it is beta blockers. But there's more people who have anxiety with erectile dysfunction than have beta blocker induced erectile dysfunction. So you should wait for a little bit post MI to have sexual activity. A couple of weeks. Not too clear. That's the answer. You don't have to agree with it. You just have to answer it. Now, if the post MI stress test is normal, you can do anything you want right away. So get a stress test and have sex right away. Everyone. I'll see you in the next section.